Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Yes, okay, we're um, very uh, pleased to introduce uh, Glenn Koak, to have him here to speak for us uh, this morning. Um, I've known Glenn for, for, uh, 20 year, for over 20 years, 25 years. We met in the uh, Tampa, Florida, and uh, have stayed in touch uh, ever since. Um, you've seen his bio. He was the founding CEO of EUNet. He's had a very um, interesting and varied career, which he will probably tell you more about in the, in the course of his, of his talk. Uh, one thing that's not in the bio is he's, he's, he's had um, a number of things at entrepreneurship, and just in the last few days, he has started River Once LLC, which was uh, too recent for, for inclusion there. So he now has an affiliation as well. Um, Amazing. And, <laughs> and, and uh, I don't need to say more about them because so much of this particular talk is, is, uh, has an autobiographical element to it. I will say that he has, that there's a, a, a small piece of this, of this that he wrote up for the timeline, ACM Interactions Timelines column that I edit, and it's my favorite column uh, in that three-year series. Um, and so I'm very glad to have him here to give this presentation about it. Great, thanks very much. So in the spirit of innovation, um, in we have a small uh, problem with uh, inclusion of several images that are supposed to appear on the next slide. So what I'm going to do, in the spirit of adaptation, out. is Jonathan's going to walk through the audience and, and, and show you <laughs> and, and attempt to hold it up for the television cameras insofar as they are there. And there's anyone on the other side of the, so the magic wall. Three in sequence? That That's exactly right. So you can get a, a sense of what's going on. So, um, and you know, I've never tried the clicker before, so I'm going to do that. And here's where the image appears. So um, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I found myself reading an article in the New York Times about um, an early demonstration of telephony, the one of the first long-distance telephone demonstrations ever. This was done during the time when the Internet was taking off and exploding, and it seemed appropriate to talk about the telephone briefly. Um, and this demonstration was from some place, so oh, some distance away in New Jersey to Manhattan. And they were having a long-distance phone party. That is, they had people at a party in New Jersey and people at a party in New York, and they were talking to each other. This is in the manner of people who used to have digital watch parties about 25 years ago and digital calculator parties. I actually attended some of those. It's pretty embarrassing. But they, they were talking back and forth and just having a great old time, and the reporter asks this question. He says, you know, what can this service be useful for? And he actually pondered, how can we use the telephone? How can it, how can it be useful? A young man might use it to pop the question to his young lady. It seemed very practical to do that over the telephone. Um, and the point, of course, was that they couldn't figure out immediately how useful the telephone might be. And that seems sort of fanciful and a little bit absurd until you start thinking about what, hmm. Let's see. Is there something magic I need to do? So I'm going to ask for a little bit of assistance here. Um, is Henry around or? There's a mouse right there. So I should use that and not this. I see. So go to, oh, as in that. Fine. Thank you. And now Jonathan will show you the next picture, which is a picture, for those of you who can't quite see it, of a pneumatic tube system in, I think, London around 1910 or so. One of the reasons why the telephone was incomprehensible was because it was so new. It was just people had to think about what it was good for. But another reason was that the world was shaped around all these technologies that they already had. The biggest signal technology was the ge geographic span of cities and nations and their markets. Because all, at that point, cities were an invention largely based on the fact that we couldn't telecommunicate across space conveniently, except for the existence of the uh, telegraph, which of course wasn't enough to break down the structure of the city. So. Um, between 1853 and 1875, they developed pneumatic tube systems in many of the major leading western cities in the world. And you could actually, by pneumatic tube, send a letter from one end of a city to another, 
you could send you could send a signed contract over several hours from uptown um, Manhattan to the Wall Street area in a few hours. Now think about that for a second. Here's this telephone, and you can talk it a long distance. Seems like a really good idea, doesn't it? it sounds like a good idea to me. But then again, you could send a hard copy contract across Manhattan in about a, two and a half hours. Doesn't seem very competitive to me. It's, you're going to talk on the phone. You could have sent a telegram. You could have sent a runner. Or you've got this pneumatic tube system. So why is the telephone even useful? And that's where, that's really the basis of a lot of where my talk goes today about the internet. And that is, New technologies are difficult to understand because we already have a matrix of, of markets and systems and people and technologies and procedures that work for us very well. And those new technologies that come in might actually be a step backwards. In particular, the step backwards that we saw with the telephone was that it couldn't send a hard copy. It couldn't send a contract. It took until about 1980 before we started commonly sending faxes anywhere. <laughs> so the telephone was a step backwards. Why can that be any good? So, what I want to do with the internet today is talk about the fact that the internet, the great disruption that it was, was in fact something that wasn't understood when it was started and enjoyed or suffered from, depending upon how you like to look at it, from a process that I call the process of anticipation, realization, and reanticipation. As technologists, and I assume most of the audience is, is working in the area of technology, we have an interesting problem that we address every day. And that is, if we're going to bet on a particular technology, either a technology that's somewhat known or a technology that hasn't been invented yet, we have to make all sorts of assumptions about what that's going to do and if it's going to work the way we think it's going to work. And the extent to which it diverges from that, is that going to be better than we thought, worse than we thought, or just so different that all of a sudden we're in a completely new world? And the Internet is a, an interesting how should I say, an interesting exposition of how that sort of stuff happened. Now, in, in particular, um, in the case of the Internet, um, I, I, I look at younger people who come into the Internet nowadays, and I know they think that all this stuff is obvious, you know, and that it probably was the result of monotonic improvement over the years. That is, we had this plan, we did this next thing, we did this next thing, and then we got this, and we knew what we were doing, and building the web was obvious, and doing email was obvious. And, in fact, it was anything but, and I want to show how that developed in this particular case. Um, some of the influences on how the internet rolled out are technical, that is within the technology itself. Some of them are external, also having to do with technology. And some are much more broadly um, determined in the manner of huge shifting social tectonic plates. And let's take a look at those in just a moment. Um, there's a, the, I have an interesting pet peeve about the way education is done in engineering in the United States. Have, having had a little bit of exposure to and only a little bit to business schools, I noticed that they're based on the case study method. Case study method works for business schools. And it, it sits at that intersection of process, like things like accounting systems and marketing techniques and so on, and then just the complexity of working in the real world. When we educate our engineers, by and large, we teach them the first part. We teach them the processes. But we don't teach them much, much about case studies of what happened in the world so they can develop intuitions. And what I'm trying to do with this talk is to rectify that error just a tiny, tiny bit and see if it might help. So, my exposition, rather arbitrary, st arbitrarily, starts with the beginning of the telephone and what that engendered in terms of industrial development across the world. Um, very quickly, um, the telephone spread around the world largely through the efforts of AT&T, setting up subsidiaries throughout the world, and those were very quickly nationalized over the following two or three decades by the countries in which they occurred. Um, they largely did this for what I like to call a, a conservative control and stability first model. Said a little bit differently, the countries that had these phone systems realized that they were vital resources for the survival of the nation and its prosperity and they simply didn't trust corporations or any other actors to run those things so they were very heavily nationalized and these organizations were unbelievable they were they were quasi military in their own structure they had tremendous spans of operations they did their own manufacturing design r&d deployment testing marketing insofar as there was marketing they were just just gigantic and they were often run inside ministries of telecommunications now when you hear Ministry of Telecommunications, you might think of one or two buildings someplace in the center of Paris or Department of, of, of Communications in the United States, something relatively distinct that sets policy and direction and law maybe. Well, it did all those things, and it also ran the phone system. It also ran the postal system um, and the telegraph system, and hence the term PTTs, Post, Telephone, and Telegraph. So these guys ran everything that had to do with remote access within their countries and outside of their countries. One of the things they did was to apply enormous hidden taxes to their populations. In other words, they made a huge amount of money and very quickly developed self-interested bureaucracies that were vital for the survival of the nation. You couldn't do without them. 
In the United States, we had a very unique situation. We actually had a private monopoly, um, thanks to the work by AT&T at the turn of the 19th to 20th century. Um, but in the rest of the world, they were really part of the Ministry of Telecommunications. Um, to say that they were playgrounds for monopolistic practices would be a kind of an understatement. The theory at the time was that these were natural monopolies. There was no other way to run a phone system, largely because they were scale businesses. 20 phone systems would be really quite counterproductive economically and inefficient. One would be extremely inefficient. Societies generally thought that it was useful to have that trade-off, monopoly for efficiency. It's not clear that that worked. And in later times, as we'll see in my talk, that started to break down quite a bit. Um, some, some fun things that happened through this that are very interesting is they had enormous, uh, enormously long-term um, financial horizons. So for instance, uh, AT&T issued, as you can see here, 40-year bonds, which they stopped doing about, I think, 12 years ago. 40-year bond is, is really impressive. It means you have a lot of knowledge about where you're going to be in 20 or 40 years, which means basically you're controlling the government. So on a technical point, um, all the work they did was based on the original work by Alexander Graham Bell and others, which was essentially circuits. A circuit meaning that if I was going to make a call from Seattle to Chicago, I would rent for the duration of my call a loop of copper, literally a loop of copper from here and all the way back. If I was going to do the same thing to, from here to Paris, I would rent that loop of copper. And all the research that happened for nearly the next century, in fact longer than the next century, was revolving around this idea of circuits, a way to bridge space through this one simple structure. And all the PTTs that worked together worked pretty much in the same way, and they knew they had to coordinate their operations. So they had equally heavyweight structures to develop standards, usually under the UN, although there was a lot of work uh, as a precursor to the UN. And in those periods, it was done by the, uh, the CCITT, the, um, and the, the acronym of fades on me, but it's the Consultative Committee for International Telephone and Telegraphy. So the PTTs marched under this model, and this brings us to roughly 1960, when the U.S. Department of Defense and others was very concerned about the survivability of the American communications systems in the event of a nuclear conflict or a nuclear standoff. I was actually involved in some uh, modernization of the worldwide military command and control system in the late 1970s, and even though the United States at that time had 43, or so we were told, different ways to get the go codes out, they were certain that all of them were completely unreliable and would disappear within milliseconds of a surprise attack. So one can imagine, it was a Cold War, there were a lot of hot rockets sitting in a lot of silos on both sides of the, of the globe. They were very concerned that there was no way to actually communicate in a robust manner. The Rand Corporation, a recent invention of the United States government, had a very brilliant researcher by the name of Paul Barron who came up with an idea of coming up with a system based that, that would provide for survival communications under hostile, that is, battlefield conditions. And what made that possible was the fact that we had, we had advanced to the beginnings of the digital age and the general purpose digital computer. Before this time, and all the work that was done on circuits was based on a, uh, cheap copper lines, which they were relatively speaking, and exquisitely expensive switching elements. The kind of stepper relays and the other components that were used in the phone system were brutally expensive. And that meant that if you had a choice between doing some computation, which was next to non-existent, or transmitting something at a distance, you always chose the transmission because it was more expensive, or much cheaper rather, than actually doing the calculation. But in the case of the appearance of, of the computer now and digital circuits, we had the opportunity to apply a little bit more intelligence to each one of the nodes. And looking at that, Paul Barron came up with a really interesting idea. And I describe that as a bucket brigade or post office model. Now, to explain packet switching takes a bit more time. But in brief, imagine that you've got a series of post offices in the country. Hey, we do have post offices in the country. And that's really easy. OK, and I want to send a letter from one to another. I address a letter. I hand it to a post office. They look at it. And they send it to the next appropriate relay or post office to send it on. And they do the same thing. Now imagine if you've got, instead of a post office, you've got an electronic system or a computer. And you receive, instead of a physical letter, you receive a series of bits with an address on it. And you receive it here, you forward it onto this one, you forward it onto that one, and so on and so forth. It's that simple, it's that stupid, and it is the entire basis for the way the internet works. Um, think of it as a bucket brigade where each member actually looks at the side of the bucket and says, oh, this needs to go to New York. Let's see, he's closer to New York than I am, boom, and sends it on. The fundamental idea behind Paul Barron's work was to create a resilient network. This is resilient because every time someone picks up a, a bucket and looks at the address for its destination, they get to say, well, that's close to New York, that's close to New York, and that one's been destroyed by a nuclear bomb. Hmm, I think I'll send it to that one instead. And they do. And that's the fundamental structure that makes the Internet work.
Now, when Paul Barron did his work, he had absolutely no idea that he was going to create an Internet. He was doing a study in an uh, environment that was largely based on statistical work, which there's a lot of statistics behind these models. And no one had any vision they were going to create an Internet. They were maybe, maybe, maybe beginning to solve the problem of survivability of communications under hostile, that is, battlefield conditions. In the meantime, these computers were being developed, and they developed under a very interesting direction. By the early 1960s, the world of computing was uh, in the United States, which was the world of computing in the world, was dominated by five corporations known as, I'm sorry, six corporations known as IBM and the Bunch. Bunch stands for Burroughs, Univac, NCR, CDC, and Honeywell. And what's interesting is that it's really not fair to say IBM and the Bunch because, in fact, it was IBM and nobody else because IBM had north of 80%, sometimes 90% of the market, so much that they tippy-toed around all the time trying to avoid antitrust suits from the Justice Department. The industry was making a, a, a transition from tubes to solid-state solid components in the early 1960s um, in a manner very similar to the PTTs. The, the things that they were developing were being built in a highly vertically integrated and a very broadly structured large industrial base. So IBM did its own research, development, planning, marketing, manufacturing, deployment, and so on. IBM was so big that I heard multiple engineers at IBM tell me that, that if you were writing in an internal IBM technical journal, you weren't allowed to reference an article that wasn't in an IBM technical journal. Now, I'm not entirely sure that was true, but I heard enough times that there was certainly some truth in there. They, they were enormous. And not only were they enormous organizations, but they made uh, well over 360 degrees of their entire product lines. So they built the hardware, they built the operating manuals, they built the training, they built the operating systems, they built the software and the services and everything else that went on top of them. And each one was completely unique and bound to that single manufacturer, hence the proprietary model of computing and software. In the meantime, um, research was ongoing on how do we make these computers more useful. Now remember, they were big multi-dollar installations for anything of any effective computing power. So a lot of the thinking went around into two dimensions. One is how do we make one computer more useful for more people? Time sharing was developed by John McCarthy at MIT in the 1950s to help take take that into account. And second of all, they started thinking of computers as a utility. How do we make them available to the public? Well, we've got a power plant in every city. Why don't we now take these time-sharing systems, beef them up, and have some way that people can get to that computing facility, either physically or maybe even over the phone? And the, the greatest project to implement that was Multics, um, a multi-user computer system developed at MIT in the late 50s and 1960s. And participants besides MIT included General Electric and AT&T, which will turn out to be very important later on in the development of the Internet. Data processing departments were extremely powerful priesthoods. Uh, they ran everything. You had to beg them for any kind of service. They smelled, acted, and looked like PTTs. It said differently, uh, you weren't really a customer if you were using a data processing department. They would tell you what you could get and when. By the late 1950s, we did see one upstart appear, and that was digital computer equipment um, based in Massachusetts and was itself a spinoff of MIT uh, by Ken Olson, an engineer at MIT and others. Um, they started to attempt to get out of the world of the bunch, Burroughs, Univac, NCR, and so on, by simply going a place that IBM didn't think they needed to go, which was small mini computers, a computer that could operate in your department or sit on your desktop or work in your lab, and they were really quite successful. Um, but things were still very nascent. Computers were still things used by eggheads and boffins and so on and so forth. Things like hypertext that we take uh, for granted was still only the beginnings of an intellectual exercise. I think it was coined by Ted Nelson in the mid-60s or so. Um, Moore's Law had not yet been conceived. People thought about the growth of computing, but there wasn't a driving fantasy about how fast computing could advance. Uh, Moore, by the way, only named it in 1965. I'm sorry, only called it out in 1965. And Carver Mead only named it in 1970, so really fairly late in the day in the industry. In the meantime, universities also had a feeling like the PTTs and like the uh, great computer companies. They were large ivory tower institutions. They were separate from society. They generally went their own way. Unlike the other organizations, they were involved in almost strictly pure research and had a huge sensitivity towards doing anything that was too commercial or would distort their seeking the truth. In their pursuit of the truth, they didn't pursue intellectual property. What they did do is they pursued ideas, which would then get out in the, in the rest of the academic world and create a certain degree of buzz or a certain degree of uh, interest there. And maybe, just maybe, someone would commercialize it. But generally, that wasn't the model. And certainly, there was no model to retain any kind of intellectual property. No one expected to go ahead and build patents or anything of the sort. 
Um, things like university licensing offices, known as Office of Technology Management, were non-existent. They simply let this thing out the door and didn't try to retain any rights to get into any kind of cash flow. Um, in the meantime, new enterprise uh, formation and financing was completely primitive compared to today. They hadn't figured out the basic rules of how entrepreneurship or how innovation works, which were done by Peter Drucker, uh, probably by about the mid-60s. Um, venture capital was relatively non-existent. If you wanted to fund a new company, you needed to go to um, a great family, like in the early days, the Rockefellers. So generally, if you were in the academic environment, you didn't necessarily think about the direct application of what you were going to do. That was something that someone else was going to take care of, maybe sometime in the future. While all this is going on, the development of the computer industry, the state of the academics, um, the uh, evolution of the PTTs continued. And I forgot to mention at the beginning of my talk, if you want to interrupt with questions, please feel free. If, um, if they're either not appropriate for the moment or I'm going to talk about them later, I'll ask you to defer. But was there a question at all? Did someone have something? Okay, great. So um, uh, in the meantime, the PTTs are evolving. And they were involved in the great analog to digital conversion that the computer industry represented. And now they're trying to do the same thing, once again, with the PTTs. Circuits, instead of renting a full loop of copper from Seattle to Paris, what you would do is you would rent a timeshare a little time slice or a statistical slice of that loop of copper. Still the concept was circuits. They were now virtualized, but circuits nevertheless. Whenever the PTTs did anything, again, remember this control and stability first model, they based all their work on three fundamental criteria which they never wavered from. The first one is that anything they did had to be profitable. It had to be a, have a viable business model. Not only that it had to have a viable business model, but it had to make strategic sense for the organization, not just now, but in three years, five years, ten years, as they would turn the crank. And one of the big questions they'd ask themselves is, does this threaten our business? Does this threaten our way of work? Second thing is they always had service level guarantees. Now remember, telephony is real time. If you call someone from here to Paris, you've got to get a response on your uh, voice in about 35 milliseconds, or the, the lack of synchronization will drive you nuts and it won't work at all. That's pretty snug for the kind of distances you're going, not in terms of speed of light, but in terms of all the other operations that need to take place technologically. So they were fundamentally married to the idea that they had to have real-time performance and they had to be able to guarantee it. Now when I say guarantee it, I don't mean it lightly. Even in the 1950s, the design model for the AT&T system in the United States was four minutes of uptime, I'm sorry, four minutes of downtime, excuse me, four minutes of downtime in a year, which when you think about it is stunning. And they did that with battery backup, with their own diesel um, generators in every central office in every town. They did it with tremendous redundancy and they built these things to be completely bulletproof. And then finally everything they did required security. The world of security in the 20th century was very different from the world of security today because largely it was based on physical security. You couldn't get to the phone lines. People didn't have access to the technology and things were very distinct in terms of here's a phone system, here are the wires, here are the, the data closets or the phone punch block closet and so on and so forth. So security was largely a matter of being separate from other areas and most people didn't have access to it. But they nevertheless took security very seriously. As the evolution of the phone system was proceeding, um, they moved on three technical directions. One was the development of asynchronous transfer mode, which was a low level um, transmission system for the phone systems. They also pursued an open system interconnection model and finally they pursued what we call o, uh, multimedia. They knew, as most people in the scientific field understood at that time, that digital technologies could eventually embrace all media. It wasn't obvious in the 1950s and 1960s that we could in fact take the voice and music and digitize it to the point where it would sound good to people or even be useful at all. But that was the direction they knew they were going and much of the work they were doing here sought that multimedia holy grail. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which was developed in response to Sputnik in the late 1950s, was addressing multiple issues related to the Cold War and the defense of the United States. And one of the things they looked at was the question of more robust telecommunications. And in the early 1960s, they put together some programs to see if they could develop new, more robust technologies in that same vein. And by the late 1960s, they had sponsored the development of, a, of the first American major packet switch oriented network. And it was called the ARPANET. It was called the Advanced Research Project Agency Network in those days. And they had two goals. The first goal was to connect expensive computers and to do research on packet switching. 
Um, I'm sorry, the connect to expensive computers, and the second was to research packet switching. Um, what was so fascinating about their work was that they, they really thought that they would use the machines or the, the network to connect different computers at, let's say, UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, Stanford, University of Utah, and so forth, and make time sharing more effective. But they didn't think it was going to happen very, fa very quickly. They thought instead that they'd need quite a bit of time to go and do their work with packet switching before it really become all that practical, and it was exactly the opposite. The network worked extremely well right out of the box. In fact, it worked so well that the people who were using the network for daily operational uh, requirements were getting in the way of the researchers. And there was quite a bit of tension there as the researchers realized they were getting blown over by this wave of use. It was really fascinating. Um, so it was sometime in October 1969, the first ARPANET tr uh, packet transmissions occurred between Stanford Research in Menlo Park, um, UCLA in Los Angeles, and UC Santa Barbara. Um, uh, people at DARPA knew that they could that they needed very desperately to make it possible for people to use machines um, remotely because they were just so expensive, but they never anticipated that it would take off anywhere near as quickly. Now, they had no commercial agenda whatsoever at all. They were solving a problem related to national defense and a little bit of cost economy in terms of use of computers inside the academic research and Department of Defense world. Um, they had no idea that any of the structures they were using were going to scale the way they did. They had no idea that the work they were doing was going to be useful commercially per se. They really had their heads down to solve their own problem in the manner of the academic world that I described in, in the previous slide and in the manner of the work of the DOD in those days. Um, to reinforce that, they had an acceptable use policy. Essentially, you couldn't do commercial work on there. And if you did, you'd get your wrist slapped and get told to get off the net real fast. But nobody did anyway. Um, this connectionless networking had some major unexpected consequences that no one really understood at the time. Now, I want to step over and talk about their pursuit of this technology. Now, I mentioned that they started ARPANET in 1969, and you recall they had this bucket brigade model that Paul Barron developed. Um, the bucket brigade model is extremely flexible, and you could set up virtual circuits if you wanted, but it was much simpler and much more productive, much faster, and you can get your development done much more quickly if you simply didn't bother with setting up a lot of what we call resource reservation on a per node basis. All you simply do is get a packet and move forward. And that's called connectionless. It means there's no virtual circuit there. There's no circuit of any kind. You're just getting a letter, looking at its destination, looking in your tables for the next hop to the next location, and out it goes. And this idea of connectionless networking took off extremely well, as I described a moment ago, in the context of the ARPANET. And now we discovered that we had two worlds of telecommunications, which no one saw coming. I don't think the world connection, connectionless appears in Barron's work, although I, I want to be careful that it, it may. But he certainly didn't say, oh, I'm going to invent connectionless networking. He was trying to solve a different problem. In connection-oriented networking, the kind of stuff that's done in the phone company with virtual circuits, you um, set up a path of hop to hop to hop to hop, where you say, okay, if I'm going to do a connection from Seattle to Paris, what I need to do is make sure there's enough computing resource on each node between here and Paris to keep that phone call going. Because if somebody from over there wants to connect to this node and somebody from over there wants to connect to this node and they all collide, there aren't going to be enough resources for all the intermediate hops. And remember, telephony is exquisitely sensitive to real-time behaviors. So if you're going to do work with connection oriented networking and if you're in the area of the PTTs and you're starting to take advantage of all this new computing power hop to hop, you're going to say right from the get-go, we need to set up connections. We need to do resource reservation. Well, it's complex. It ain't simple because you have to have all sorts of ways to talk to a central service that sets up the circuits, that talks to all the other guys who are setting up circuits, that reserve connections, and then what do you do if one of them collapses, and so on and so forth. So it's messy. But the guys at ARPANET, on the other hand, said, nah, we don't have to solve any real-time problem. We just want to see how this packet switching thing works. We're not going to bother. We're just going to... Let the packets go where they are and see if they work at all. Surprisingly, it did. I'm going to step back and look at my slides and see if there's anything uh, I, I really want to add to uh, the things I've said before. The, the, in sum, though, if you're going to set up virtual connections in a packet switching environment, it's exceedingly complex to do it. Huge overheads. You need to do a lot of work and you have to have bigger nodes that are more expensive. If you're going to do it in, if you're going to do connectionless networking with this bucket brigade model, it's exceedingly simple, but it's also exceedingly robust because you don't have any connections to break in the first place. You knock out a guy in the bucket brigade and you send packets to the next guy instead. Unlike the PTTs, 
the three critical ideas of a business model, guaranteed performance, and security were irrelevant. And I, I want to emphasize the point. It's not that they're relevant in the sense of, well, you know, do we need security guarantees? Do we need a business? It was nothing like that. They simply weren't doing that kind of stuff. It was just not on the plate. Um, and furthermore, ARPANET applications didn't need any kind of high performance uh, applications. They were doing things like file transfer and remote job entry and email, all of which can be sent in minutes to hours to days even and be far more productive than anything we had before. Um, the academic environment turned out to be extremely compatible with this kind of research because although academics can be very demanding, they also appreciate the fact that they're working on something that has not yet been fully invented. So there's a discovery process of figuring out what that's about and they're willing to live with it and flex with it. So we saw by the 1980s the creation of two worlds in telecommunications. The guys in the PTTs, the connection-oriented guys, the virtual circuits guys, and the guys over in the ARPANET who were doing connectionless networking. There really wasn't an antipathy between these two groups. They'd actually gone to many of the same schools, and they knew each other. And there was a moderate amount of mixing, although career paths and the like tended to create two very distinct communities. But they knew each other, they knew what each was doing, and they knew they were doing completely different things. The phone companies were making systems that people needed to run in real time, to be reliable, to have a business model, to work, and so on and so forth. They knew the internet insofar as they even thought about it. Couldn't satisfy real world requirements, it wasn't going to do the job. So it's kind of those boffins, to use the British expression, out there in the corner, fine, let them, let them go do it. The internet community knew that they were a prototype knew that they weren't going to do anything commercial, knew that it wouldn't work for the phone system anyway, and just kept barreling along. It, it, was, it was really quite amazing. They, they simply didn't pay that much attention to each other because they knew one guy was doing one thing, business and hard, real-world things that people need, you know, down in the trenches, and the, the guys up in the ivory towers who were just mucking around with stuff, and maybe it was pretty neat, but it was ivory tower stuff, and that's it. Systems to, for the, to send the data? Absolutely. And in fact, there were some, some uh, there were a lot of meet points in terms of people and technology. But by and large, what occurred was that the standard phone systems in those days were still analog. And what the ARPANET people would do is they'd simply rent long distance analog lines and then they'd put their own modems on either end and take it from there. So even, even that degree of cooperation at the level of packets was nowhere near uh, existing. But so it's a really good question. But so, so it's really crazy. They're just going on, on completely separately. Now, the, uh, this point can't be made too many times, so I'll try to make it one more time. They just weren't thinking about commercialization. It wasn't an issue. It's not that they didn't get economics right. They didn't get real time right. Who cared? Right? They just didn't think about it. Um, the PTTs, uh, in the meantime, didn't pursue connectionless networking. Why? As I said a moment ago, eh, they knew it couldn't work. It just wasn't a technology. And they had all this momentum anyway, and not to, not to mention what, we, uh, what I like to call career equity. If you've been working on technology your entire life, you're not going to stop when you're 47. You're just going to keep barreling. Maybe, maybe we can oops, go into retirement ages. Hold on a second. So there we are. Um, they could have pursued packet, uh, packet switch networking in a connectionless model, but they didn't. You know, time horizons, all sorts of other things, completely compatible. They just didn't bother. But history marched on. So um, after that first ARPANET transmission, circa 1969, um, we started to see some new technologies coming in on the left field. Nobody ever anticipated these technologies. Unix was developed by some former uh, MIT Multics researchers, uh, most particularly Ken Thompson and others, at Bell Labs in Murray Hill, New Jersey, um, pretty much as an internal research project. Um, either it was celestial navigation or a game program and they needed a new operating system. Um, so Ken Thompson wired something together on an old discarded PDP-7. Um, the system he designed was based on Multics. He'd worked on Multics. Um, AT&T was in Multics, as I mentioned before, but it pulled out for reasons of focusing their resources elsewhere. Um, in fact, that's a good entree to a very important point, which is that thanks to a 1956 consent decree, AT&T was not allowed to do anything in software or computer services. It had agreed with the government that it was going to do telephony. It was a monopoly. It was going to stay there. Otherwise, it could unfairly go out and eat one industry at a time using its monopoly funding of the phone system. So the stuff they did at Multics, the stuff they did with, with Unix, was never done with commercialization in mind because they couldn't. And from my reading of history, I think this is probably pretty safe, no one was out there thinking, okay, well, maybe in 10 or 15 years we'll start nudging into that. These researchers were simply researchers at Murray Hill, very ivory towerish, just like the academics of the era. The Unix operating system, everyone knows a bit about it, so I'll just make it quick. It's, it's simple, it's stupid, it doesn't do much, but it does it well. It's very adaptive. And it doesn't solve every problem, but it solved the problems the guys had in Bell Lab. Sounds an awful lot like connectionless packet switching, doesn't it? 
at the same time, Ethernet technology was being developed. Now, there, there's a wonderful story here. If you want to see things that are contingent, um, this is just a perfect example. Um, in the 1960s, the, the people in the research community, academic community in Hawaii needed a way to communicate between the islands. They couldn't lay uh, sub-ocean cables, too expensive, or it didn't have the capacities they needed. So they started doing things by radio. And they started doing computer-to-computer -computer communication by radio. Sounds pretty simple. But some of, those, some of those islands are a few hundred miles apart, which means there's some time lag. And if you start sending packets over radio, it might be that I start sending a packet to him while she starts sending a packet to him, and they both land at the same time, and he can't hear a thing because they're both on the same frequency. So the guys at Hawaii developed this thing called Aloha Net, cute name, and it said basically, we'll just let anybody broadcast to anybody in these 20 or 30 nodes, however many they had, probably a lot fewer than that to start. And if somebody can't hear, if they don't get it, they'll just ask for a retransmission. Or, even better, everyone will listen. And if they realize during the time of their transmission of a packet, one or two or three, that somebody else was transmitting, they'll back off for a second or two, and then they'll transmit again. And everybody used random variables. So one guy would back off one second, one guy would back off five seconds, and so on and so forth. Pretty interesting idea. Well, um, uh, Steve Crocker, one of the great leading lights of the Internet, the guy who largely invented the Request for Comment series and was one of the or original organizers of the Internet Engineering Task Force, the place where all Internet standards are developed, was talking to his, his housemate in Cambridge uh, in the late 1960s, and that happened to be Bob Metcalf. And I think Bob had just had his PhD thesis rejected from Harvard. His thesis was on, MI, uh, was on multics, and they found it insufficiently novel or new or something like that. So Metcalf's running around for a new topic, and they're, they're hanging around in their living room together one day, this according to Steve Crocker about two years ago. And Crocker said, why don't you go take a look at that thing called Aloha Net, which Metcalf proceeded to do, and he proceeded to do his PhD thesis around that, which was eventually accepted, I think, in 74, thereabouts, by Harvard. And based on his work with taking the Aloha Net and putting it inside a coaxial cable, basically taking the radio environment of the Hawaiian Islands, putting it inside a single radio enclosed environment, a coaxial cable, applying the same rules and some better statistics and some other, other details of engineering, you had a way to have people get on a local area network with individual transmitters that didn't know about any other individual transmitters, that just sent packets out there, and if they collided, they'd retransmit. And it turned out to be dumb, simple, terrific, and terrible for real time. Because you could never guarantee a delivery, just like connectionless couldn't do in the phone system. It's kind of like there's these, there are these waves of things happening. And something I didn't mention with the Unix operating system, not only was it basic and simple, but it couldn't do real time either, which everyone knew in those days an operating system needed to do. It just had a schedule that gave everybody a shot, which seemed fair. You know, here are queues, and you want to do a job, and we'll take it off the, off the queue, and we think it's about right, and we'll kind of balance it out, make sure no one gets starved, make sure... No one gets too much, and so on and so forth. Ethernet's in the same vein. It was just simple and stupid and worked very effectively. Now, there was no reason to think that this stuff would actually work because it's based on all sorts of, frankly, very exquisite statistics. Leonard Kleinrock at UCLA did some terrific work demonstrating that, well, you know, you're going to get congestion, but a lot of the time you're not. In other words, most of the time it's going to work pretty well. So uh, the Ethernet technology worked very, very well. Not quite out of the box, but pretty close. And... Then in the, uh, I guess, mid-70s, 1975, uh, Mike Lesk and others at AT&T came up with this program called Unix, Unix Copy. Now, they've got all these Unix machines that have been distributed to different, actually, Unix software, operating system software, that's been distributed to dozens of universities around the United States. Unix took off like wildfire in this small academic community. People were having a great time with it, and AT&T was allowing people to freely use the software and trade it, fix it, do whatever they liked really a very important input to the beginnings of the open source movement. It was being done that way because AT&T couldn't make money on software. They couldn't sell it. They couldn't service it. They could only give it away. So they proceeded to do that and create this huge community of interested people. But they were giving away tapes and it was taking a lot of time. They were thinking maybe there's some way we can distribute this over the phone system. So they developed this system called Unix Unix Copy. Real simple. You got a Unix machine over here of any kind and it's capable of dialing a phone number. You've got another one over here that's capable of receiving a call. The two of them call each other and they agree to exchange bits. And Unix Unix Copy takes care of that. Um, the Unix Unix Copy system was a huge leaking capability for almost no cost and like Unix and like the Ethernet, it wasn't terribly, ro it wasn't terribly um, uh, high performance. It wasn't real time. It was reasonably reliable, but it got the job done. Orders of magnitude better than before. Anything over zero is pretty good. So, 
um, also around the same time, uh, 1975, they would had enough experience now with the ARPANET that they started to figure out an improved division of labor between the different layers, and I won't get into that too much, but the different layers of functional that were happening in the world of ARPANET. And they broke a program called NCP, Network Control Program, that had run the early ARPANET into two layers, uh, the uh, superior layer, TCP, and the lower network layer, the IP protocol, that was defined by Surf and Khan in 1974 in their famous IEEE paper. So while this is going on, um, and all these developments are happening, a lot of people are finding this stuff very useful and very exciting. So there develops in the United States a Unix users group, which after receiving a nasty letter from Bell Laboratories, renamed themselves Usenix, because you can't use Unix, it's a trademark term, in spite of the fact that no one can sell it or make money off of it. So Usenix developed in a very large community, starting in 1975, of Unix enthusiasts, original universities, and then a lot of corporations, including digital equipment and others, started to play with this thing and have a lot of fun. The same thing happened in, in Europe uh, several years later, 1979. Europe had a different complexion because being uh, a region of dozens of countries rather than one country, it had national groups and so on and so forth. But there engendered a huge community of, of, of enthusiasm and a lot of ferment, a lot of interaction. Not a small population after time. And one of the things that happened si uh, simultaneous to this, now in the late 1970s, was Tom Truscott and some of his buddies at Duke University, grad students, said, you know, we've got this Unix, Unix copy thing and we've got people calling, calling computers back and forth. Why don't we set up a really loose system? And we'll just have our system here at, at Duke. And we'll say, call us at night, dump your mail, and then call us a few hours later, and we'll send you the mail we got from the other guys. And by the way, you do the same thing. If you want to be part of the, and actually it was originally called the UUCP net, but people know it as Usenet now. Um, if the only rule is if you're going to you know, get stuff from us, you've got to also act as a relay. So if, if you use us as a relay, use us as somebody else. And within a few years, they had 50,000 nodes running. That's a lot of nodes in those days. That's a lot of Unix systems. I think that the vast majority of them were, in fact, mini computers. So there are large corporations all over the place. And the folks at Usenix agreed to become an umbrella for what was going on there. Still completely free. Oh, by the way, fun, fun point. It used to cost about $2.35 to call Chicago to Florida, which I did a lot in the, in the 70s. Two thirty-five for a minute. So one of the nice things about uh, the Usenet and UCP is that you can make local calls <laughs> pretty much all the way across the country and have effectively a free email service. It's not quite that simple, but they did piggyback on lots of universities that had watt systems, a term that's not used anymore, wide area telephone service, um, and so on and so forth. So it was a really great way to hide under the radar. Also, you already had an account at the university for your phone system. You didn't have to get anybody's permission. You just started making phone calls, although the bills did start to pile up and people got surprised. Soon after this, 1982, the guys in Europe looking across the pond said, you know, they're doing this in the United States. Hmm, maybe we can do something similar. Maybe we can get out there and, and uh, have a way to do this. In Europe, it was much more complex. You m might not know, for lack of experience or having heard the history, that it was illegal to ho hook a modem up to uh, the phone lines until, uh, Jonathan, do you know the date? The 1970, 1972? Um, very late in the day. Illegal to hook a modem unless it was an AT&T modem, and even then they were huge, expensive, and nobody used them anyway. In Europe it was even worse because there were dozens of modem standards. They were very illegal to connect in Europe, and you couldn't make phone calls from Paris to Berlin to save your life. If you thought 235 a minute was expensive, you should have tried European calls. So they set up a two-layer hub and spur network where they would have, just like Tom Truscott and friends at Duke, they'd have a concentrating center in each country, and they'd call into their country, and then everybody at night would call into Amsterdam and exchange the second layer up in that manner. Worked very effectively, all very convivial, and a volunteer network. In 1983, ARPANET converted to TCP IP and started to grow technologically. Um, more on that in a moment. And then completely out of the blue, something everybody didn't expect. Remember, this was the world of mainframes and mini computers up until now. And then this thing called the personal computer invented. We saw the Apple, the Apple II, IMSI was around there during those days. And soon thereafter, the rise of the IBM PC, which I suspect people in this room know a little bit about. Um, also, not expected. Uh, some of you may know that, um, well, the famous quote by uh, Ken Olson, he thought that there'd be no market there. IBM, in fact, in the 1960s and 70s did a huge future systems project to determine if they should move computing to the desktop. They decided it was not viable, decided they would not do it, although there were big politics involved in that one. But in short, no one saw it coming. Um, and in 1986, we had the NSF, NSFnet ARPANET cutover. Now, the reason why this is significant is because up until this time, 
the ARPANET was connecting universities all over the United States and a few in Europe um, via this one backbone. So computers directly connected from their lands to the ARPANET at the University of Illinois, Stanford, MIT, um, University of Maryland, uh, Washington, and so on and so forth. But what, what the NSFNet did was by a huge evolutionary leap in protocol design, uh, that is the software that controls communications and digital networks, they went and they broke the ARPANET into two parts. They maintained the backbone, but they set up regional networks for all of the major, what should I call them, confederations in the United States. So the Big Ten had um, a network, the CIC net, New England had NISER net, the Bay Area had Barnet, and so on and so forth. And the effect that this had that was so important was that you were, you not just had a closed small community of researchers who were working directly on ARPANET, now you had lots of communities in different regions of the country and developed a huge amount of knowledge and skill on how to use these networks. Said differently, training was occurring through normal use and expansion of the technology. In the meantime, the PTTs are moving forward on developing their own standard that's going to take care of multimedia and embrace the entire world, solving the hard problems, the ones that we know normal connectionless packet switching can't do. So I'm going to pause there and talk about the great solution of OSI. Now recall that the pursuit was for multimedia, becoming the medium that every, would work for everybody everywhere for every use all the time. And OSI was one of the major elements to make that go. It was championed by everyone, the PTTs all over the world, uh, the United States Department of Defense, the European Commission, all the major international actors. Um, every major manufacturer built an OSI stack. The people in the internet community, the people in the regional community, expected that they were going to transition to OSI as well. Why? Because the internet was a prototype. It was never designed for commercial use. This OSI stack did have an economic model behind it, by and large. It did have better structure. It did allow for much greater control. And it was much more universal. It didn't do just one thing. It did everything everybody needed. It was really a very, very broadly designed system and very, very logical. It was there to solve the big problems that everybody knew they had, including supporting telephony and other related things. Um, there was extensive OSI deployment. Marshall Rose wrote a great book called The Open Book, which was found on the desk of almost every networker in the world in those days, talking about the transition from the prototype system, Internet Protocol, and the, and the Internet and ARPANET, to this OSI model that they were going to go to. All the PTTs were behind it, but there were some problems. And the biggest problem was that it tried to do everything. It tried to make everything work, and it was designed by organizations that really were extremely heavyweight. In other words, they were making the thing work for them first and foremost, rather than the actual material needs of the user community. Although, with 100 years of experience, they could legitimately say that they understood their user, user community, and in many ways they did. Um, problematically, you needed every part of the OSI stack to work. Problematically, you could never get all the parts because they were never quite done. Problematically, once you put them together, you couldn't figure out a way to make it go. Said a little bit differently, they tried to solve everything and it never worked. It just never took off. So networkers, time after time after time after time, tried to make OSI work, and it didn't work. In the meantime, they've got this IP stuff, which is showing up now on Sun workstations and Apollo workstations, and it's available under Unix on AT&T machines, digital equipment machines. Uh, the guys at Berkeley have now done a standard Unix distribution. They've got sockets. They've got all the networking code. It's everywhere. Often it's free. AT&T was still distributing software in those days, and it's just taken off. It's going everywhere, and it's solving people's real-world problems. But they all knew it was temporary. It was just doing what they needed to do to get things done today. And among the other things that they did to get things done today was Dan Lynch, who was running the, the um, data center at UCLA, would host every few months what he called an interoperability get together and basically he'd hire get all not hire but get all of his buddies in the industry and they'd all meet for two days over a weekend they bring in all their machines and they'd try to make them all work because Dan was buying lots of different machines he wanted them to work together and this grew and grew a little bit more and finally he spun out of UCLA and started the uh, interrupt trade show and found himself running what became a hundreds of million if not billion dollar business simply based on the growth of all these people solving their day-to-day -day problems um, in Europe um, uh, an environment that was hugely dominated by the OSI model with the national research networks and the national post telephone and telegraphy uh, operators. Um, a group of them, including uh, Daniel Karenberg, were sitting around one day and said, you know, 
we needed an IP association for Europe. In those days, they had a thing called RARE, the Réseau uh, uh, Académique Recherche Européen. And uh, uh, Daniel says, you know, I think we need, we need a RARE for IP, so why don't we call it Réseau IP Européen? And they started, not a trade association, but a, an interoperability group for engineers. And that took off very actively. And now there was an umbrella in Europe for people who were trying to make their internet working work and just get practical networking done every day while the other guys were taking care of the big picture. And because the early and later day ARPANET always connected to military bases, because it always connected to, to commercial sites doing research, not commercial work, but research, there were a lot of people in the world who were actively using these systems. And when the regionals were developed, a lot more people found themselves um, now becoming customers. So IBM, Tandem Computer, HP, started becoming customers of regional networks. Now, remember, it was still academic, but it was starting to get a little bit big and a little bit heavyweight. Um, so some of these guys, um, uh, let's see, Paul Schrader at, I think, NyserNet started to realize, you know, this is getting a little bit crazy. We need to see about, about getting out there and doing a commercial company. So he spun NyserNet out and started Performance Systems International, the first, one of the first commercial internets. The Usenet Association went to Rick Adams, one of the system operators at SISMO, the place at the University of Maryland or affiliated with Maryland that was doing um, uh, seismic testing to look for nuclear bomb explosions in the world. They were a branch of the DOD at the time. And they had a node there that probably had 5,000 dial-up customers every day. And it was getting huge. And Usenix looks out and they say, remember the Unix Association, realizes this is getting too big. You know, we, we got to get rid of this. It's out of control. Rick, would you start a company? I think Rick turned him down twice. And then with a $50,000, I think, no interest loan, he finally agreed to take his machine out of the University of Maryland Seismic Center and actually start running um, Usenet at at least one note of it as a spin-off commercial venture, which was called UUNet Technologies, which became quite famous in time. Um, in the meantime, the guys at EUNet uh, foolishly went off and hired me in 1990 to see if I could figure out what to do with this crazy volunteer network, and we incorporated EUNet um, in 1992 as a Dutch and Irish company and started selling services more actively all the time subject to acceptable use policies. So in fact, we were selling, uh, the, and this applies to, not to the Usenet guys, because they were a dial-up network, but the guys at PS, PSINet, the guys at EUNet, the other spin-out networks, they were all on this very fuzzy edge of trying to get stuff done while they couldn't engage in commerce while they were engaging in commerce. It was, a, it was a pretty special time, to put it uh, mildly. Uh, something I didn't mention before, in the early 1990s, all the researchers around Europe who, time after time, and by the, I mean at the major universities, time after time were trying to get their work done with OSI and it wasn't working, and they were using IP on their local campuses with Ethernet and other ring networks, started going, this isn't working, we need to do something. So they banded together and they formed a thing called eBone, the European Backbone, where they simply started sharing leased lines across Europe and all of a sudden, IP starts exploding there. And by 1994, eBone starts to incorporate. So we've got this case where people are just trying to solve their problems. It's an academic world. They're, try they're trying to do what they need to do while realizing the big, heavy stuff. Well, maybe it's going to happen now. They're not really sure. But they, ha they have no choice. They're, they're, the momentum is carrying them forward. And then the commercial internet exchange is formed. And I use the commercial internet exchange as probably the real, the real breakout moment for the commercialization of the internet. Uh, Rick Adams uh, at UUNet, I believe, Schrader, PSINet, and maybe the folks at IBM got together and agreed that, you know, we're using, remember, everyone's using all this public infrastructure, right? They're using the, 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 the regionals, many of which are not incorporated. They're using the um, NSFnet um, as the backbone, and they're all exchanging things over that. It's getting pretty dicey because they're using these resources with acceptable user policies. They're not supposed to do that. Um, so they finally agree, you know, we'll do a deal with uh, Metropolitan Fiber Systems in Washington, D.C. on this optical ring they've got around the city, and we'll all agree to meet there and exchange traffic there. And that was the first time where major traffic exchange at a level of lease lines and heavyweight IP was done without having to resort to public resources. And that breakout moment is very important because it now meant that they could move forward completely unfettered and say when, when a commercial guy talks to a commercial guy, it's legal and legit. We're not going over public resources. If we do go over the pu public network, it's to get to somebody who's on, and when I say public network, I mean the research networks. If we get to one of those research networks, well, that's to talk to a research guy about researchy things. What's wrong with that? NSFNet was very happy to see this, by the way, because it was getting pretty crazy inside the offices at the same time. Bit of a, bit of a commercialization tiger by the tail.
So more and more regional networks continued to uh, become commercial ISPs or they were acquired. In the meantime, also out of the blue, uh, Tim Berners-Lee did his terrific and seminal work leveraging the existence of the domain name system and the namespace that it provided uh, to make two small little viral tweaks, a transport protocol and a markup language, actually viable to glue all these systems together using hypertext. And of course, the great interface advance, uh, the first web browser mosaic, got out there and was distributed like wildfire. And the internet was completely exploding. Before, we'd had email that was going across these systems and some FTP, but all of a sudden, everything, everyone was doing things with visual information, lots of pictures, a lot more text, and a lot more population. And all of a sudden, the demands on the network was, were exploding. Things were really doubling every maybe six months, maybe even faster in some milieu. But in the meantime, OSI was supposed to become the standard. There's this huge wave of utility going out there, and OSI was to become the standard, and it just never happened. The, the, the model that everybody knew they needed, the PTTs, supposedly the incumbents, the guys who were going to take over the world of networking, were blown past by venture-funded, uh, stock-fueled, and entrepreneurially advanced internet, te uh, internet technology. As I said before, it never really worked completely. They could never get the entire uh, suite. It was exceedingly complex. So whenever there was a choice between trying to make OSI work in a great cooperative fashion or just going ahead and using IP and getting your networking done, it worked time after time after time in favor of IP. Europe in particular being excelling at diplomacy over all things was using OSI originally as a way to knock down IBM and then as a way to maintain some bulwark against the huge technological juggernaut of the United States realized that their efforts were being dashed upon the rocks and eventually came out to support IP, in spite of the fact that OSI was supposed to be the model that was allow, going to allow them to continue to propagate their view of technology operations and economy. One thing you mentioned before, that even within the internet community, it wasn't completely competitive, even within the internet community, a lot of people thought that it should get turned over to OSI at some point. Well, yeah, I, I, hope, I hope I'd said that, but I, maybe I wasn't clear. And, and that's, it. that's not just sort of, I mean, it's flat out. Every, Everybody had the open book on their desk. That was for the transition. The U.S. government was in favor of In fact, there were a series of meetings in 1992 in, in the IETF where the IETF was going to officially decide um, to go ahead, it's so it seemed, to, to replace some of the IP components with the OSI stack. And that would start a huge element of that, and it completely blew up for reasons I'm not yet entirely sure of. Um, I know, I know the, the mechanisms of how it blew up. But I don't know who grabbed the ball and said it's IP, IP, IP above all things. And I'm not sure what their motivations were. And I'm going to keep poking on that. I think it's, it's, it's very cool. But I'm glad you asked the question. Everybody thought OSI was going to take the day. And everybody thought the PTTs, the business guys, were going to do it. Uh, by the time the entrepreneurs started, they realized, you know, I'm doing this thing. Maybe the PTTs will buy me, but I don't have any choice to wait for that. I've got to do it. Uh, that, that entrepreneurial uh, moving sidewalk is a great motivator. Um, so as I've said now multiple times, the, the IP internet worked terrifically well. It was available, relatively simple to use, cheap. It was universal. Everybody had it. Grew fantastically fast. And Steve Gold, Goldstein, who was in charge of, I believe, international connectivity of NSFNet uh, in the late 80s and 1990s, spent years wondering, when's the world going to figure out that we're out there? And one day, I think it was in Newsweek, it announced the existence of the internet. And he pasted that on his wall at the National Science Foundation with a big magic marker. Hey, they found us. <laughs> It, you know, overnight sensation, right? Only 23 years in the making or something. So the great disruption began, and we know a lot about that disruption. It, it overturned telecommunications, which largely collapsed for the better part of a decade. Trade, the structure of work, personal relations, group interactions. And my argument here is that the major inputs were the things I've now said many times, but the single most important one was that it was non obvious and even nonsensical. Here we are staring at this thing that works really well, but it was just the place where we were experimenting. The real game was over here. So um, I, I think, I, I don't know if I want to call this my thesis, but my observation is that the reason why the internet took over the world, and remember, it destroy, almost destroyed the telecommunications industry, um, is that everybody knew it wasn't the real deal. Everybody knew it couldn't work. And therein lies a little bit of magic. So here it is, 1996, and I'm on a plane from Europe to the United States or something, and I happen to be sitting next to a very well-dressed venture capitalist. And we're having a great old time talking about the industry, this, that, and the other thing. And something came up, and I said, blah, blah, blah. He said, blah, blah. And I said, well, you know, when the next Microsoft gets invented, um, then, then, you know, there'll be a disruption of some kind. And he looks at me with this great knowing smile, and he goes, there'll never be another Microsoft. 
And I said, what do you mean there'll never be another Microsoft? He says, we know too much now. Microsoft only happened because they could work in obscurity. People didn't get computers. But we know to look out for technologies now. We're all waiting. I mean, they built that company without even venture capital until the last three months or whatever it was. And somebody here knows better than me about those details. There'll never be another way. We know too much. Guess again. Obviousness, every generation has their own feelings about what's obvious, what's not, what's going to work, what's not. And there's always room for a surprise. The interesting thing about the Internet was that it took place in the light of day. Everyone looked at it every day. Well, I take that back. It was somewhat obscure. Even mighty Microsoft didn't discover it until, what, 1994. And with good reason. It was hiding, but it was hiding in a huge community, and it couldn't work. It was just the experiment. Remember, we had other technologies, too. We had bulletin boards, which were more public. People knew about them. Not as powerful, not as widespread, but more a commonplace that people saw. We had commercial services like General Electric Network. We had MCI Mail. Um, we had CompuServe. So we had lots of things that were bumping out there, but we didn't have this engine of enormous productivity around a simple um, attribute. And that attribute is that the Internet did not do much, and it could not succeed with the requirements that everybody in the telephony world knew were necessary. But it turned out that four minutes a year was too stringent. People would accept a day of downtime a year. They'd accept a week if it cost them one-tenth as much, if they could do email and the web and lots of other things. So when it came to, do I need four minutes a year of rely, downtime reliability and just have a phone system and don't have much else? Or maybe I do have a Minitel in France, but it's real expensive. Or I've got this thing that's just exploding and everybody's using it and it seems to be up when I need it. Which one wins? Well, it... I think it's obvious which one won. <laughs> so um, there will be another Microsoft. The Internet worked in obscurity. And that brings me to my closing quotes. So if you have any questions, um, I think we have another, Jonathan, 15 minutes or so. You didn't mention Al Gore. <laughs> I didn't. There are some stories about Al that are the subject of another talk. Al, Al was important. Al was the point man um, in the Senate who did make sure a lot of good funding happened. Um, and so, to a certain extent, he does deserve credit for being a, a real positive player in that, in that space. It's kind of unfortunate he's become a joke. Uh, um, but he probably did stumble and take a little bit too much credit once or twice. Um, and that's probably enough to say about our formerly elected officials. <laughs> yeah? I mean, what would you say are like the main lessons looking forward about how we think about mass innovation? Um, you know, I don't have a general theory, um, and it would be hubris to say so. I, I've never studied future studies and things like that, uh, except in passing, you know, Faith Popcorn and a, a book here and there. Um, the model I like to use instead is to say that there's something that engineers and technologists and just people are good at, and that is just accumulating lots of stories. Um, that, that There's that cross between, oh, I've been here before, by story, or my intuitions are telling me this, so I'm, I'm hoping through this uh, MBA-style case study to just give you more intuitions. But I think at least the following attributes are to be attended to. The first is have huge respect for things that don't make sense. And the extent to which sensibility is a representation of the current regime, whatever that is. Uh, the second thing is, and I, I wish I had a diagram for this. I'm, I still haven't quite figured out how to put it together. But you have the inherent technology and your expectations for what it's going to be. Let's say it's based on new models of statistics, like Black-Scholes equation or something. All right, so that's, it, the question is, does that work in and of itself? Then there are questions of what pure technical inputs are necessary to make that work, which you may understand uh, deeply or just a little bit. Then the third thing is, are there external technical inputs which can change your competitive position or which just upset your fundamentals that you base on. So for instance, the rise of CMOS destroyed a company I was a director in, a big company, a quarter billion a year revenue, which in the 80s was a lot of money. CMOS blew, away, blew past our expectations. So watch out for, for changing tides. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned, the, and I like the metaphor a lot of tectonic plates, be aware that the platform you're standing on may change drastically. The, the, the transition we saw until three weeks ago was this move towards more and more, uh, more and more uh, great utilization of statistical processes in business. The IP is statistical in ways that, that the PTT circuit switch model isn't. Um, markets are statistical. Maybe they're going away <laughs> in ways and so on. So be aware that there are these huge societal trends 
you know, the emergence of venture capital, the emergence of these statistical process, the, uh, the rise of international trade, that are the platform on which your stuff works. And I think it's really wise to do what they did, at least anecdotally that I heard, they did at NASA in the 1960s. Which they put together all their designs and, you know, hammer on them in terms of the inherent technology really hard. And they'd step back and say, what can go wrong with all the tech? And then they'd back up and say, what can go wrong bureaucratically, you know, in the bigger environment? And th then they get all that done, and then at one point they say, okay, uh, no more questions, we're locked in, let's go forth. So that's, that's the way I'm looking at it right now. And it, um, but it's tough. I mean, it's, I don't think anyone can predict markets. I think the best you can do is either realize that it's not going to work because of something that's going to happen, or realize you've got to keep your eyes open for something that, a, a particular thing out of left field. But there are always surprises. And this, of course, depends upon the, the two dimensions of span of your work. One is how many disparate things are you bringing? You're building a chip? Or you're building a, a, a new kind of social networking. You know, this is very narrow. It's understood, prescribed, and this is broad. And then the other one is, is how big a world are you planning it for? I mean, is it, uh, and especially what's its duration? I mean, six months you can probably plan. 18 months you can probably guess. Two years, which is why I think um, things like incremental development and software um, has an inherent advantage because if you can do a spiral development, you know, uh, stepwise, you got a much better chance of doing this kind of thing. Great leaps, of course, can do more good, but they're really exposed. So that's, that's my short answer. <laughs> yeah? I don't know how early it was or how much it influenced other things, but I know IBM had a network um, among its, all its mainframes, at least by or if it's the commercial customers, sure. um, called the BitNet, um, by at least 87. Um, which stood for because it's there, right? Uh, and they uh, they wanted to be able to update all their their customers from you so bet. they could send data, and then and since it was there, they let all the customers talk to each other. Right. Um, uh, that was, it was similar one in back to old Decknet. Oh yeah, huge. So, it, there, there are two stories that that for lack of time and for reasons of complexity, I just couldn't even bring in today. One is the rise of uh, the data processing world and all the networks it engendered. So exactly the things you're talking about. The IBM networks, system network architecture, which was uh, supremely important for the development of Microsoft, um, and DECnet, and all the other s practical solutions that were being done under what I'll call a more central control pre-IP model. And that had influences on this, and they were also an approach like the PTT OSI model, and they were great advocates of OSI by and large. They were also a group that got dashed by just the explosion in internet group uh, use. Um, Hank Nussbacher started um, BitNet with Ira, his last name uh, 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 fades out of my head at this moment, but um, that was originally a, an IBM to IBM machine network, I believe, and BitNet became CREN, or I believe, uh, Computer Research and Education Network, which was a kind of a mirror of the ARPANET, and I believe that moved over to IP sometime in the early 90s. Similarly, in Europe, there was a and, and a very big IBM-sponsored network. Basically, IBM moved to Europe and gave away machines and said, connect them together using our systems. And that was called the European Academic Research Network, or EARN. Very successful. Um, but you're right, no, lots of other stuff going on. Um, but just to be able to make a point, I need to narrow down the threads. I didn't know how much it influenced so it was just um, that You know, uh, what, what was so, one, of the reason, one of the ways that it, it influenced it certainly was it was yet another element of confusion. And I don't mean confusion in a negative way. It's here we got the PTT model. Here we got data networking, which was big. I mean, multi-billion dollar business. IBM, Digital, Hewlett Packard, Tandem, others. Um, Cren, BitNet, Earn. Um, over here you got IP. So trying to, trying to decide which pony to pick on was crazy. In 1984, I was directing an R&D lab. And my chief science, scientist and I were, we owned the internet protocol work in our corporation for, for sales. We sold one of the first IP suites on the VAX PDP 1170. And um, we were trying to figure out what to bet on. We all knew that IP was old and out of, goo out of juice. It was 10 years old. <laughs> and so we were looking at XNS, Xerox Networking System, which, by the way, has some very distinct improvements over IP, and for good reason. They got another seven or eight years of experience and made some different decisions. Um, lots of stuff in there. And in, it's, it's funny. At some point, being accurate flies in the face of being understandable. Because <laughs> there's just so many players, so much stuff going on. There I mean, are hundreds of thousands of, of you know, threads and engineers. Think, um, actually, several, I was thinking about another problem. There are several lessons to be taken. But I think if I would, one I would say is to, you can't really ignore the importance of open source stuff. 
Um, I, because a lot of the case studies, I mean, the people actually did things, they believed in what they were doing. Absolutely. They had the vision, they saw it. They may not have seen the scope of it, but they saw what they were trying to achieve. But what happens is, you, unless it's sort of like make, them, make it available, easy, all that good stuff that happens in open source and people contribute, you can't build as big bubble that you want. So I think yeah. you can't really ignore any of that stuff. Yeah, I completely agree, although, um, uh, as, as correct as you are, I'd like people to be aware of the historical point that the idea of open source, as named by Stallman and others circa 1990, kind of the beginnings, all this stuff had, all, the momentum was already there. So there was a, let's say there was an open community. And, and, and actually, of course, there was um, uh, the open group and other people who, who owned eventually the, the Unix standard um, and its compliance suites. Um, so let's just expand that a little bit. There was a community of interest that made this go. And it was a community of interest of practical use. And the openness, not so much open source, although that was true, it was simply open on all fronts. They shared lines, they shared equipment, they shared ideas, they met at Usenix, they met at the European Unix user group. Now there was a lot of other ferment going on, but this one seemed to have so many dimensions of infectiousness going. Oh, and by the way, another point is, you know, we didn't understand what viral meant in those days. We didn't understand that we were basically building these autonomous forces. Anything from memes to an actual computer virus to just a, an industrial standard that just started to take on a life of their own. So your, your point's a very good one. Um, certainly an, an interesting, uh, another interesting story. Yeah, I think, I mean, part of, the, part of the point is that you just, one of the things going on is you also have thousands of people being trained up on how to Engineers being trained up on Unix and on, on the internet, you while uh, you had a smaller number inside the companies working on OSI. Although I, don't, I, don't, yeah, I think that's right. No, I'm not so sure that the fact that you train on something uh, essentially immediately translates. Even though people make that mapping all the time, which is like you train on this, so you're much more comfortable with that. I think it's it's more along the lines of how many people are are contributing to something. And if you've got more and more people starting to contribute to things, then there, there's so much inventory that is created, right. that right. so much domain knowledge, so much IP that is created right there that you you just, you know, for, for example, we, we suffer from this in research here. We try to do something on Windows versus when we look at stuff that's going on in the new world and all the other stuff. We A lot of times we're catching up, which is so sad because we don't have a lot to you know, really work on. But if we were just to work on some of the stuff that was existing, we would do a lot more. So I think a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I agree. Lesson. I didn't mean training in the sense of students. I meant training in the sense of the network administrators and all those yeah. people who were doing problem solving and, yeah. and yeah. contributing. Yeah. Yeah, and, and actually to, to go back to uh, an element in the in the, in the presentation, um, what was happening while OSI was trying to get it right with this? And by the way, the OSI community was huge. Make no mistake about it. But it it wasn't getting the opportunity to gain both technical operational and, and then social learning about how this thing would work. And, and in a sense, it, it's like water you know, finding its own level, right? OSI was still heavyweight structured. I mean, the, and look at, look at the difference, again, something I couldn't get into for lack of time. Look at the difference between the IETF and OSI. IETF would, would promulgate a standard if it had two running versions. And very often, someone would design something, you know, offer a standard, someone else would do it, boom, it's out there. And it, it was this and of the philosophy you know, in, in the ITF was, and kind of persists at least nominally to this day, although one wonders how well they do it at this moment because it's now become a big locked up system. But the idea was that get something out there that works a bit. Get started and it will accrete, which is a fundamentally different approach from saying make sure everything's going to go right. Make sure everything's going to go right has two, two elements that I think are worth mentioning. The first is that if you run a business and you don't want something to go wrong, or you don't want to destroy your business model, you got to do it that way. But the second thing is that it's, it's based, and this is a really interesting breakpoint conceptually for engineers and others, it's based on an assumption that, you know, you can run into dead ends. you got to make sure you got the whole picture together. Now, i got to tell you, this is where my heart lies. i got this math degree from Illinois, and I want to make sure the whole thing hangs together before I go investing in my career. All this stuff. But here are these Internet guys, and this is kind of one of the great untold stories. Um, Although I'm going to try to tell her right now, well, we'll do an increment, we'll do an increment, we'll do an increment, and there's no dead end. Or if there is a dead end, it's just a simple matter of software. We'll fix it. And it worked. That's the crazy thing. I mean, even Vint Cerf, the, one of the co-authors with Bob Kahn of the original TCP IP paper, says, we never thought this would work so well. Now, that said, 
they have wrapped hundreds of protocols around TCP IP, and it has changed quite a bit, but it still works. Now, you can put the lie to that and say, well, V4 doesn't work, version 4. Now we need version 6. Well, maybe not, because now we're developing network um, translation and so on and so forth. It, it works for what we're designed for. Because, you know, the people, some people argue that it doesn't work, you're just under the legacy of that system. You're not even going to move forward. Well, and that's why I, I had that quote up at the beginning between Joe and Lyon, Edgar Snow. What's the meaning of the French Revolution? It's too soon to tell. Uh, so, so here's the big bugaboo, right? Markets have just crashed all over the world, largely because our faith in derivatives turns out to be, if not unwarranted, then misplaced in terms of who was running them. Well, IP has got some similar attributes. Here, it's this running down the railroad tracks as fast as you can, not looking for the light coming from the other end of the tunnel. And it's statistical, and IPv6 isn't moving anywhere near fast enough, and IPv4 is out there, and, you know, <laughs> is, are we on our way to Thermidor, or are we on our way to just, it's a simple matter of software, we'll keep lashing it together. We'll see. Okay. Yeah. I think let's thank Gwen. Oh. <laughs> Thanks everybody.